Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jillian Dunks. I'm an archivist in McMaster Library's Department of Archives and Research Collections, and today I will be moderating this session. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to Digital Access and Indigenous Histories, Supporting Self-Determination and Historical Research in Community, a presentation with Heather George. Before the presentation begins, I want to acknowledge the original and current inhabitants of this land, the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations, on whose territories I, as a Hamilton resident and McMaster employee, now live. This land is protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and allied nations to peaceably care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes. Hamilton is also covered by the Between the Lakes Treaty No. 3 of 1792, a treaty between the Anishinaabe Moan speaking Mississauga people and the Crown. As a settler, it is imperative that I learn more about the history of the region in which I live um, in the spirit of honoring the Indigenous peoples whose land this is and working towards a more just future. Today, I am honored to learn from Heather George, whose presentation traces the long history of Haudenosaunee resistance to colonization and the Six Nations communities work to protect their land. For those of you who may not be familiar with this particular region, um, Haudenosaunee and Mississauga communities work to protect the land is ongoing. Um, I'll just list a couple of um, things that I'm aware of, uh, but these are you know, by no means a comprehensive listing. Um, so the recent work by the Land Defenders of 1492 Land Back Lane in Caledonia, um, and also some advocacy work by both the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation to critique Bill 23, which is um, the Ontario government's More Homes Built Faster Act, which infringes on Indigenous treaty rights in this region. Um, I honor this work and I encourage everyone to pay attention to and support the work that is happening in their own regions by Indigenous communities defending the land. So today you are joining us for a partnership event between McMaster Alumni, uh, Woodland Cultural Center, and the Department of Archives and Research Collections. The event is part of the Archives Alive series, which introduces members of the public to the unique holdings of the Department of Archives and Research Collections. Uh, a reminder for today, the talk will be recorded um, as the video prompted you. Please submit any questions you may have in the Q&A area, and we'll try to respond to these at the end of the presentation. My colleague Bridget Whittle is also monitoring uh, the Zoom chat. Um, and lastly, it is my great pleasure to introduce Heather George to you. Um, Heather is a mother, gardener, beater, curator, and PhD candidate of Euro-Canadian and Ganyangahaga descent. Heather's home community is Akwesasne, and most of her professional career has been spent working in Six Nations of the Grand River. Much of Heather's work has been directed at gaining a better understanding of the culture and history of her nation. She is a PhD candidate at University of Waterloo, where her thesis work examines the historical and philosophical underpinnings of contemporary museum practices across Haudenosaunee communities. Heather is currently on leave from a curatorial position at the Canadian Museum of History. Additionally, she recently took on the role of president of the Canadian Museums Association. Um, Heather, welcome. I'm so looking forward to this talk. Thanks so much. That introduction is a bit embarrassing. It's really the truth of the matter is I'm bad at saying no. Um, so uh, thank you so much, everyone. And um, welcome to this talk today. Um, so as Jillian mentioned, my name is Heather George. Um, my family is from Akwesasne, uh, and I grew up in Cornwall. So that's the uh, town that's right beside the reserve. Um, and uh, I've been sort of uh, working in Six Nations uh, area, although right now living on Algonquin territory in the Ottawa Valley. Um, and uh, mostly I just wanna say thank you to everybody in Six Nations who has always made me feel really welcome um, in that space and on that territory. So uh, again, thank you, Jillian and the staff at McMaster Archives and the Alumni Association. Uh, big shout out to Dr. Rick Montour, Tannis Hill and Heather Bomberry at Deoha Hage at the Six Nations Polytechnic. Derek Sandy, who kind of started us down this road of research. Uh, Taylor Gibson, 
uh, Logan Smith, Catherine Morrow, Kenneth Deere, Jolene Rickard, Teresa McCarthy, um, Sue Hill, the staff at Woodland Cultural Center, especially Patricia, Janice, and Chris, and the Department of Canadian Heritage Museums Assistance Program. I probably didn't get everyone, but that's uh, quite a few of the folks and, and organizations who have helped make this happen. So um, to give you a little bit of background, um, and I realize, oh, this is the slide I want to start you off with. So um, where I am uh, working right now is Woodland Cultural Center. I'm a guest curator working on the 1924 exhibition. Um, and Woodland Cultural Center, it's the 50th anniversary this year. It opened uh, the year after the Mohawk Institute closed, which is also known as the Mush Hole. That's the center image here. Um, it's one of the few remaining residential school buildings in Canada. Um, and it houses um, an archive, uh, gallery space, uh, permanent exhibitions, a collection, language department, uh, there's workshops ongoing. Um, and right now, um, there's a great program um, that Patricia put together with uh, Cody Houle, who is an artist in residence. Um, Woodland Cultural Center welcomes school groups, uh, as well as tours and hosts lots of special events and festivals. So there's some contact information there. Um, they're on Instagram at Woodland Cultural Center. Uh, and Facebook, and you can reach them on the web at woodlandculturalcenter.ca. Uh, and if you're looking to book a tour, tours at woodlandculturalcenter.ca. Um, so that's a little bit about where I'm coming from professionally. <laughs> So the overall project uh, that led to this research at McMaster uh, is a physical exhibition that's set to open in October of 2024. It's one of many activities that's going on in Six Nations of the Grand River and throughout the broader Confederacy to recognize this uh, historical moment. Um, we're also developing a traveling exhibition through a series of banners, a curriculum guide, um, access to archival records through a platform called Mooker2 with Hugh Buffalo. Um, and additionally, we're supporting a plaque-based exhibition in Geneva, Switzerland, um, and other, as I said, community commemorations. Geneva, Switzerland, uh, that project is because uh, Levi General, who at the time carried the chief title of Descahe, went there to petition the League of Nations. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about him later on. So why is 1924 important? Um, on October 21st, 1924, the first band council was elected in Six Nations of the Grand River. And from that point on, the community uh, had two forms of governance. The Confederacy Council originating in the Great Law in the 1100s, which uh, had been sort of relocated and adjusted um, to the needs of the Grand River community following the American Revolution. So after the American Revolution, um, our communities were kind of uh, spread out a little bit further, and so adjustments had to be made. Um, and then also the elected band council, which is legislated by the Gradual Enfranchisement Act in 1869, which was a law of the federal government um, that became part of the Indian Act in 1876. Um, and I should say that um, move was supported by a small uh, number of people in the community, um, but not certainly not everyone. Um, this moment in history has continued to have ripple effects across time uh, within the community. And understanding the context of this time period, as well as the concerns and matters that led to this event are important, not only to understanding present day community matters, but also future discussions of sovereignty, nationhood, governance, and community well-being. This image is one of the election posters that was placed around the community. Um, Woodland has one of the posters in the collection and it's currently undergoing uh, restoration so that it can be used in the exhibition. Um, for those of you familiar with paper or not familiar with paper, um, paper that's made from wood pulp is very acidic and so it can very easily sort of break down over time. And so that's why we have to do some conservation work. So um, the collection that the records that we're looking at today come from primarily our um, uh, collection 
from A.G. Chisholm. Uh, and he uh, was born in 1864. He died in 1943. His office was located at 78 and a half Dundas Street uh, in London, Ontario, which today is the location of a Subway restaurant. Um, he served in the Northwest Rebellion of 1885, and in 1888, he was called to the bar, so he became a lawyer. Um, he worked with Chippewa the Thames uh, over trespass that would or what they said was trespass onto their reserve by Muncie, Delaware Nation. So a little bit of uh, inter-community issues there. Um, he also, uh, in 1891, worked with Oneida of the Thames, um, seeking, he was seeking information on elected chiefs from um, the federal government for that community. Um, in 1896, he was retained by the Mississaugas of the Credit, and in 1907, he was hired by the Six Nations Confederacy, um, but this was without departmental approval. Um, in 1918, um, he was also hired by the Indian Department, so Indian Affairs in Ottawa, um, after he had done some work with the Potawatomi of Wisconsin, who had been forced to relocate to Canada. Um, he was representing them uh, to try and have funds that were being given to that nation um, by the U United States government. Um, he was trying to get those funds for folks that were up here uh, in Canada, north of the 49th parallel, but Ottawa intended to control any funds that were received. And I should say Potawatomi, uh, these folks still have not been uh, recognized by the federal government to this day. Um, in 1921, he also presented at the Ciro v. Galt case, um, which was a really important case uh, in Tyndinaga that had to do with fishing rights. Um, and he was involved with three main issues in Six Nations of the Grand River. So he was involved with um, trying to seek restitution for losses relating to the Grand River Navigation Company. He also uh, took a case to trial over uh, the New England company and their land sales, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, in a minute, and also the status case, so the um, recognition of Six Nations as a sovereign nation. Um, and I just wanted to point out, this is sort of uh, an important fact, I guess, that some folks know, but not everybody. In 1927, from 1927 to 1951, Section 141 of the Indian Act made it illegal for Indigenous people in Canada to hire lawyers. Um, so a lot of Chisholm's records at McMaster actually include correspondence back and forth with the Indian Affairs Department, where he's trying to get paid for the work that he had done. Um, so here we go. Um, Chisholm basically acted as a general counsel for the Six Nations Confederacy. Uh, he successfully represented Six Nations of the Grand River in their case against the New England Company. They had large land holdings in what is now Brantford, Ontario, around the Mohawk Institute Residential School and Her Majesty's Royal Chapel of the Mohawks. The land um, was leased by Six Nations to the New England Company, who were part of the Anglican Church missionary work. Um, and they, they, the church, later sold the land to various companies, including the Cockshut Plow Company. So the case resulted in the return of some of the land, which is where Woodland Cultural Center is located today. Um, and there's this little news clipping from the Brantford Expositor uh, from 1922. Um, and he also worked with Six Nations for uh, about two decades on the Grand River Navigation um, case, um, which was never brought to trial, um, and restitution has never been made for the loss of land, um, the changes to the river, um, and some other issues that we'll get into uh, later on. Um, and that slow clipping was published uh, in the Expositor in 1927. This is one of the documents that I accessed at the McMaster archives. Um, page six and seven are excerpts that cover the role of the Honorable uh, J.H. Dunn, Receiver General of Canada, who also served as a trustee for the Six Nations. He also was a member of the Welland Canal Company, um, and the Welland Canal Company relied on water, which was redirected from the Grand River to operate, which of course impacted the river. The Grand River Navigation Company, um, as I mentioned, linked to the Welland Canal, uh, the first Welland Canal, there's actually been three. 
Um, Dunn invested Six Nations money to his own benefit. And page eight speaks to Lord Glenning and Sir George Arthur's knowledge of this matter, as well as requests for the Six Nations Trust Fund to be transferred from Canada, uh, sorry, transferred to Canada in whole. So it was being held uh, in the UK. Chisholm prepared this document and in it he states, uh, it is certain that various sums were from almost the commencement of the works on the Grand River with drawn from the Indian Trust Fund and invested in the enterprise by the acquisition of shares and bonds and other securities of the canal company. So certainly um, folks that were in positions of power and authority within government and society, both in Canada and the UK at the time were well aware that this was going on. Chisholm also assisted the Confederacy in preparing various petitions to people in positions of authority. So this petition to Sir Charles Metcalf, who is Governor General of British North America at the time, speaks to the role of the Six Nations as allies to the Crown during the American Revolution. Loss of land resulting in the formation of the townships of Dunn, Cayuga, Brantford, and the town of Brantford. Mismanagement of trust funds from these sales and leases and monies received by Indian agents for timber cut on Six Nations land, that money not being obviously put into the trust fund. Um, additionally, they point out uh, that they're charged £150 a year for their trustee, Colonel Jarvis. So this is the same Jarvis that Jarvis Street in Toronto is named after. Um, and they say that he allowed um, all of these funds uh, to sort of be mismanaged. And there's um, actually quite a few historical records about this, so it's not too difficult to find sort of the evidence of that broadly. Um, so here we go. In 1919, uh, the Confederacy established a committee to review the status of Six Nations, and Chisholm was hired to prepare a memorandum on their legal relationship to the Canadian government. Um, this image is of Levi General Descahe, and I'll share a little bit more about him in a minute. Um, Chisholm's argument primarily rested on historical documents from the British Crown, um, which repeatedly used the term allies to describe Six Nations. The committee wanted this memorandum to be presented to the Supreme Court of Canada, so that's the highest level of court in Canada. Um, Chisholm instead went to Ottawa to meet with the Deputy Minister of Justice, Newcomb, who forwarded the matter to Duncan Campbell Scott, who was in charge of Indian Affairs at the time. Uh, however, the government was of the opinion that the status case should not be submitted to the Supreme Court of Canada, which seems a bit like a conflict of interest. Um, and finally, it was decided that the delegation would be sent, um, finally, it, sorry, it was decided by Six Nations that a delegation would be sent to England and a new lawyer would come to overshadow Chisholm and champion the Six Nations argument for full sovereignty. Uh, as I mentioned, Levi General, who was carrying the chief title of Descahe at the time, and who was also the speaker for the Confederacy, and George P. Decker uh, from Rochester, New York, traveled to the League of Nations in Geneva, which is now the UN, to petition for the recognition of the rights of uh, his nation, of Levi's nation, uh, sorry, and really the Confederacy, he was Cayuga, so one of the nations, um, in 1923. Uh, however, Chisholm clearly disagreed with this approach and was in contact with the Loyalist Association, uh, another group from the community who were advocating for the elected form of governance. So uh, Asa Hill, who had been the secretary for the Confederacy and sort of left under um, not great terms, not, not good relationship terms, that's for sure, uh, went on to be the secretary for the Loyalist Association. And he wrote to Chisholm on August 29th, 1923. Um, and he says, as you've been associated with the status case, you know quite well the real contention to that of the impossible demands of Levi General and his clique. Reasonable, and so Asa continues on to say that reasonable terms embodying the elective system of council, vote for six nations, the Grand River Navigation Company, accounting of um, Indian lands, so he, mean, he means uh, lands that were lost through uh, theft, um, rights for Six Nations to have a vote on any measures affecting said Indians. My favorite, clean out the Indian office at Brantford as we believe it is a source of great deal of our trouble. Um, so he's listing all these things that he would like to, that the Loyalist Association would like to see addressed by Chisholm um, and also that 
they believe an elected system would address. Um, and he says, do you think it's worthwhile to address a letter to the League of Nations refuting the actions of Levi? Um, so there was lots and lots of support for Levi General and continues to be to this day. Um, but there, of course, um, like in all communities, there was disagreement. And so these folks did not agree with that approach. Um, on August 30th, 1923, Chisholm wrote to Asa, um, and he agrees uh, in regards to taking steps to refute the absurd documents that have been presented to the League of Nations. I think Chisholm was also a little bit upset that the Confederacy had chosen to hire um, Decker, who was an American lawyer. Um, in late summer 1923, newspapers uh, who had, had been associating Chisholm with Descahe, with Levi General, um, but his response published in the evening advertiser makes it clear that he felt that this was an internal matter in terms of internal in the Canadian government. And so he says, just let me say I have nothing to do with Descahe or his appeal to the League of Nations, consider the same most ill-advised, unnecessary, and doomed to certain failure, and have done all in my power to aid in having all differences between the Indian Department and the Six Nations Council settled by some domestic tribunal. The Indian Department made the Six Nations Council the fairest and most generous offer that any government could make in the endeavor to bring about the settlement of the trouble, but the Descahe fraction secured its rejection. I'm sorry, there's a couple typos in there. Um, so what Chisholm is referencing here is that um, the uh, federal government under Duncan Campbell Scott had offered to hold uh, a royal commission, um, but in the way that the commission would have been laid out, who the commissioners would have been, it would have really privileged the voice and opinions of the um, Ottawa uh, in an unequitable manner, and eventually uh, Descahe, Levi General, and the Confederacy rejected that approach. Um, in 1923, following the opposition to that commission proposed by Indian Affairs to look into government, um, sorry, Following opposition, a commission was um, put together to look into governance in Six Nations. So Colonel Andrew Thompson was sent to Six Nations to undertake a review of various matters on the reserve. Um, and there's some back and forth here uh, between folks, um, uh, Chisholm and others. So on September 7th, uh, Chief Andrew Stotts and uh, J.S. Johnson signed a letter which is signed by Asa Hill as secretary. Um, as the executive body of the Loyalist Association asking the commission to cover the costs of retaining Chisholm to present at this um, commission. Um, on September 8th, 1923, Chisholm writes Duncan Campbell Scott, Deputy Superintendent of Indian Affairs. Um, and then again, on September 14th, um, he writes, um, discussing the redress of grievances that have been hampered or spurned by ill-advised malcontents on reserve. Uh, so he's referencing um, the folks who were arguing for Six Nations recognition of sovereignty. That's who he's saying are malcontents. Um, on September 17th, 19. 23, there's a telegram from Thompson uh, to Duncan Campbell Scott, who's opposing council appearance. So he's against lawyers being at this. Um, and Duncan Campbell Scott, uh, as I mentioned, was Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, so sort of had the final say on these things. Um, this is a, a picture of the Thompson Commission poster, and as I mentioned originally, this Royal Commission had been suggested by Ottawa to look into governance in Six Nations. Um, it was heavily weighted with representatives who probably would have supported the Canadian government and the, the Loyalist Association. Um, Colonel Andrew Thompson was known by many of the veterans in Six Nations. Um, he had led one of the uh, groups in uh, Europe that they were a part of. Um, and his grandfather had been one of the principals in the Grand River Navigation Company um, and built Ruthven Mansion um, with his, his uh, funds, with his money. Uh, it's a historic site still today. Um, and this, the report that Thompson issued was used to justify the implementation of the elected band council in Six Nations. Um, even though Chisholm had publicly disagreed with Levi General, um, he was 
I think, still liked by some members of the community um, who supported the Confederacy because he was invited to speak at the Longhouse in 1928 as part of the celebration of the United States upholding of the Articles of the Jay Treaty, which allowed for unrestricted passage across the Canada-US border. Um, the improper application of immigration laws and the ignoring of the Jay Treaty um, in 1925 had meant that Levi General's uh, health care providers and his family couldn't visit him in Rochester or at the Tuscarora Reserve by Lewiston um, after he returned from the League of Nations. Uh, this court case is really important. This is why um, Indigenous people from Canada can cross into the United States using an Indian status card instead of a passport and it went to uh, trial um, because of, uh, I'm so sorry, I forget his first name, but uh, Del not Delisle. Um, I'm so awful with names sometimes. Um, there's probably folks in the audience who can pop it in the chat because they probably remember it, but a, a gentleman who is an iron worker um, from Ganawage um, who was working in the U.S. And, and was facing issues around that. And so, um, yeah, if you're in the audience and you have that answer, we we'll pretend it's like a game show and you can put it in the chat. Okay. Um, so this is another letter that came from um, the McMaster archives. Um, and uh, it's from SR Lickers to AG Chisholm and it's dated January 11th, 1939. Um, and it helps us understand that more than just land was lost when the Grand River uh, was flooded by the navigation company. So in this letter, Lickers writes, I suppose you saw the article in the paper some time ago by a German, I understand, stating that the Indian of Canada are being starved to death. Of course, I can't answer for others, but the same was being denied by a member of our band. He said there was no evidence to show they had, which I contradicted because many died at the tune of the Grand River navigation when the crops were flooded and there was no money left in the treasury. Beyond the mismanagement of Six Nations funds, the flooding of land, destruction of crops, and change in the movement of water, which would later impact fish stock, as well as see increased levels of cholera and malaria in the community, all had extremely negative and long lasting consequences for the community. When I was reviewing the archival material, this letter, um, it really upset me. Um, it was such an important reminder of how much the community had been impacted beyond just financially or loss of land. Um, and so it's important to recognize that archival work can also be very emotional uh, for the people doing this research, especially when you're close to the people or the community, which the documents are about. So I wanted to uh, speak a little bit about the role of the archive and how they support self-determination. And then uh, Jillian is gonna come in and talk a little bit about her experience um, as an archivist in supporting community. Um, and I also wanted to thank folks who submitted questions ahead of time because I'm gonna answer some of them in this slide um, and then some of them just before I turn it over to Jillian. Uh, and then we'll get to even more questions at the end, hopefully. Um, so uh, I wanted to just make a note here that digital research access is not the same as digital repatriation. So digital repatriation really has to do with control over use and copyright. That's the big difference, right? Can a community reproduce and use the material in whatever way they would like, or are they having to pay uh, for copyright licenses um, to an archive or a museum or, or even like a newspaper? Um, in most cases right now, the work that Woodland has collected um, is more so digital research access, uh, with the exception of McMaster. So we have the right to uh, use this material, uh, to read it, to uh, quote from it, um, but a lot of it if we want to put it into the exhibit itself, we have to go back to the organization um, and ask for the rights to do that. Most of the time, most archives, especially when working with Indigenous communities are pretty good about that. But in some cases, you can end up spending a lot of money uh, to be able to reproduce um, images or letters for from your community or about your community. Um, Natalie, Sarah, and Richard all submitted questions um, relating to this question about 
um, sort of digital access. So digital access has been really important to this exhibition. Um, we have archival records that we've accessed from Philadelphia, Geneva, and Rochester, to name a few locations. And the cost to visit archives, especially over and over, can be prohibitively expensive. Digital access is also democratizing. So now we can make sure that other organizations and Six Nations and individuals have uh, easier access to this material. And I should say this doesn't always work, especially for small community organizations. They don't always have the capacity to digitize the material, most often human capacity. And so sometimes that ends up being up to the researchers. We have to go and take photos of things ourselves. Um, so one of the big limitations um, for me <laughs> personally in this work has been keeping track of and organizing what I estimate to be over 4,000 pages of records um, and identify a platform that can host the material. Um, so this is ongoing work and I've certainly had some really great volunteers and research assistants helping with this. Um, and right now it's on a Google Drive, um, but we're hoping to um, work with University of Buffalo uh, to move some of it onto a platform called Mooker2, um, which would give uh, sort of better and simpler access to uh, community instead of just getting a file full of archival records that you kind of have to sort through. Um, and shout out to any of the U of T students that are listening in um, who are going to actually be doing a lot of work to transcribe uh, some of these records and organize some of them for me because I'm, I'm a one woman show some days. Um, I also wanted to uh, sort of give a little bit more of an uh, expanded answer uh, around a question that Jillian submitted uh, and sort of the concept of emotional awareness. Um, so a bit about uh, Jillian asked about community connections and sort of how McMaster built them. And, and in this case, so there's a couple answers to that. McMaster has lots of professors from Six Nations working there uh, and a pretty long history of relationship with Six Nations. Additionally, this is a, a community directed research project. So um, it's directed by Woodland. We initiated the contact to access these archival records. Um, but working with um, uh, Jillian at McMaster especially has been so great because she, you know, at the end of the day would ask me like, oh, what did you find today? How was your day? And when I, you know, talked about this letter that was really upsetting, she was really uh, sympathetic to that. And that's a really important skill that probably isn't on most uh, archivists job description, but it that um, sympathy and and care for the people is really, really important. And I do think that it's useful for organizations to be proactive uh, and notify communities as they're able to of what material they have. Um, archives are important for validating community experiences and knowledge for outside audiences. So often we have oral histories um, about the things that have happened in our community, but unfortunately, um, sometimes we still need to have archival documents to back those up. And actually this image on this slide is a pretty like great example of that. There is um, a story uh, from uh, Chiefs of National Historic Site uh, about um, Pauline Johnson's father, uh, George, who when he was a young man, uh, the story is told by Evelyn, so his other daughter, Pauline's sister, uh, she talked about how when George is a young man, he was sort of like really enthusiastic about um, the Anglican church. Um, and he rode into the Delaware uh, village uh, and destroyed a bunch of their totems. And I had read that uh, in Evelyn's memoirs ages, years and years and years ago. And then this summer when I was at the Penn Museum looking through their archive, um, this photo is in their collection and it's a Delaware totem in Six Nations. And I had never seen this. Um, so it gave me a better understanding um, of what that story from Evelyn was about and actually what uh, her father had done. So you can imagine that even things like that created great conflict within the community. Like I can't, you know, ha imagine having someone come in and destroy this, this beautiful piece that's um, I'm sure very important. Uh, and significant. Um, so 
the the work of digitizing archival records also helps us to connect disparate sets of information so all these different stories and histories that are in different places and reconnect them together in one virtual place um, it helps us to understand how we got where we are today so uh, we don't have the ability to time travel just yet um, and so of course archival records and oral histories are like the really the thing that lets us understand what was happening or get closer anyway to understanding what was happening in the past. Um, archival records also provide a great resource for educators to use in the classroom. Uh, they assist in legal research for things like land claims. Um, and then it's also important to think um, for folks who are working in archives about the metadata and the terminology that's being used. A very good example of this um, is uh, the American Philosophical Society. Of course, they're a very big archive, so they have and they have a lot of resources to do the work that they do. But um, many archival records are documented by sort of the person who deposited the collection, who gave the collection to the archive, right? So this collection that I looked at at McMaster is the uh, A.G. Chisholm phoned. Uh, and so it's listed under his name. Um, and so one of the things APS has done, the American Philosophical Society, uh, is they actually created a map on their website that shows all the different records that they have that might be listed by someone like under a name like Chisholm, but it actually shows what community, what nation they're related to. Um, and so even in the descriptions on an archives uh, online database, they can add in things like Six Nations or Haudenosaunee or, or Cayuga or, or these, these other words that help us to search for these records. Because if you didn't know that A.G. Chisholm had been a lawyer for Six Nations, you probably wouldn't know to Google his name as a place to start. Um, there was also a good question uh, submitted from uh, Michelle uh, about um, sort of uh, disability ability justice and the relationship to this exhibition and digital archives. Um, and I will say that one of the big challenges for this project in addressing that is that there's limited capacity. There's me. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm also our basically our exhibition designer for this exhibit. So thankfully, there are places um, who have published their guidelines online. So things like the Canadian Museum for Human Rights has uh, their guidelines to how they actually, um, what type of font they use, what size it is, where they place it, um, to try and deal with some access barriers, uh, as well as physical access. Um, and certainly, I've had to learn to be a lot better about doing things like when I'm making PowerPoints or if I'm making a PDF, making sure I also try and keep a Word document associated with it so that there are other options for people to access the um, information. Um, so I would love to do more, but yeah, limited capacity, I would say for us right now. Um, and then one last question um, that I wanted to get to, and I'm actually going to put a couple links in the chat for this one, just before I turn things over to you, Jillian. Um, so I had a, I think a really important question that is sort of off the the topical area, uh, but not, it's related. It's more of a professional question. Um, and it was submitted by Nicole. So Nicola asked, as an Indigenous woman, how do you cope with microaggressions and racism and what resources do you suggest? And I'm assuming, Nicole, that you're referencing uh, sort of in terms of like the gallery, library, archive, museum sector. Um, and so to answer this, I think it's really important for uh, folks to understand that I'm fairly conflict avoidant and due to my life experiences, um, aggressive uh, people, especially um, male identifying folks can make me really nervous. Um, so over time, um, I've had to sort of learn how to deal with things. Um, and honestly, working in community by and large, I didn't have to worry much about this. Um, and if I was facing inappropriate comments or microaggressions from non-community members, things like, wow, your skin is really light, or residential schools weren't that bad, I went to a private school. I was in a position of authority, and I was supported by my managers and coworkers 
to feel like I could address those things. Um, and also I had folks to talk to after when something like that happened. So I didn't question myself in the way that I was thinking about things. Um, leaving community, that really changed a lot. So my advice, um, and some of this is reflected in that New York Times um, article, um, is to be careful who you work for. So what kinds of policies do they have? Are you going to be the only Indigenous uh, or person of color or queer person working in that organization? Um, making sure you keep a file on your computer of educational resources like journal articles, both to back up what you're saying, essentially like a running bibliography, and also to provide resources to people who might otherwise be like really awesome people. They just haven't had these conversations yet. That's not always the case, but sometimes it is. And it's nice if you can give people benefit of the doubt and support their learning. I know it's additional labor and it doesn't feel great, but if we don't do it, I'm not really sure who's going to. Um, I've also had to learn to keep journals uh, and document the issues that I'm encountering in the workplace. This was, I, I can't remember the person who said this. I was at a seminar and they said that they had done that in their workplace. And so I also started doing that. Um, I've built informal support networks of other uh, Indigenous professionals and, and non-Indigenous professionals who are really great allies. Um, and honestly, uh, I would say if you have the ability uh, to leave an organization, there is no shame um, in doing that. Um, and so I put those two resources, um, the New York Times article, which talks a bit about these things that I've said, uh, and then also a resource that um, might help folks, especially uh, in the glam sector, which is the Canadian Museum Association moved to action report. And it is pretty um, straightforward and honest about some of the historical and contemporary issues in our sector. And I think it's one of the tools that you can reference and say, this isn't just coming from me and my personal experience. Here's an actual report that was done on some of these issues uh, in the sector. And so it's another resource that you can provide to people. So I wanna turn things over now um, to Jillian uh, to share uh, her experience uh, as an archivist and sort of being on the other side of things. And I'm gonna uh, switch to, let's see. There we go, the slide for Jillian. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, that was really wonderful. And my head is just like a buzz with ideas. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. And I know that there are a lot of questions, um, so many questions in the Q&A and so many comments in the chat. So I'll try to keep um, my comments fairly brief, uh, you know, about 10 minutes. And um, if we don't get to all of your questions by the end of today, we will um, pass them on to Heather and I will read them as well. And, um, you know, so your comments will be received uh, definitely at least, I think it's fair to say. Um, so Heather asked me to talk about some of the work that uh, my department did to support um, Woodland's 1924 uh, exhibit, and um, I think also to talk a little bit about some of the professional resources that have been um, helpful. Uh, I'll talk about those for me personally, but um, I, I know too that other folks in my department are aware of these resources and have read them. Um, the information that I'll summarize is not uh, an exhaustive listing. You can see in this slide um, that there's a list of some of the um, standards, which I found to be really um, helpful as a, as a settler archivist approaching this work. Um, and there's also a picture on the slide of our, um, our reading room. So if you're interested in coming to, to see the archives, this is the space that you would visit. Um, we are in the basement. So, you know, um, uh, what to say, there can be some challenges associated with that. Um, but you know, we, we do our best with the space that we have. So uh, some of the standards that have been really helpful for me um, thinking about uh, working with Indigenous communities, the, the first one is the Protocols for Native American Archival Materials. Um, this is a document that was released in 2007. Um, it's fairly short. Uh, it was created in the States by a group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous um, archivists, librarians, curators, and um, historians. And the first principle that this document um, outlines is that Indigenous communities are sovereign governments um, with whom non-Indigenous custodians of records need to consult and be in relationship with. Um, the protocols are, they list action items for um, archives and libraries 
Um, and then they also list action items for um, indigenous communities. Um, and it's important to recognize with this document, um, I think it, it almost goes without saying, but I'll say it, that you know, indigenous communities are, are all distinct, um, distinct nations. And so all of these documents, the protocols and the guidelines, um, you know, kind of need to be interpreted according to the situation that you're in. Um, one of the key principles coming out of the protocols, and this is a direct quote, um, is that libraries and archives need to recognize that Indigenous communities have primary rights for all culturally sensitive materials that are affiliated with them. So these rights apply to um, issues of collection, preservation, access, and use of or restrictions to these uh, materials. At minimum, the protocols charge archives to uh, respond cooperatively to requests for records um, from communities for community use and retention. Um, and they point out that records that are held at a distance from communities um, can become estranged from the people to whom they are most relevant. Um, as Heather has noted too, this work of providing digital copies to support projects is not the same thing as full repatriation of records. Um, you know, in full repatriation of records, legal rights and, and often physical custody of the records are um, returned to communities. And you know, this is a piece I think that the Canadian archival community really needs to um, consider and is kind of working its, its way towards considering. Um, the next standard that um, is really influential is the OCAP principles. Um, these were developed by the First Nations Information Governance Center. Um, so this is an entirely indigenous developed um, standard. And the principles establish um, specifically how First Nations data and information will be uh, collected, protected, used, or shared. Um, and this standard is kind of coming out of a um, health data context, but it has some applicability, I think, to, to archives and museums as well. Um, really briefly, the principles are uh, ownership. So communities own their data. Um, control. Indigenous communities are within their rights to seek control over all aspects of the research process which affect them. Um, access. So uh, Indigenous communities must have access to data about themselves regardless of where it is held. And uh, possession. Possession is the mechanism by which ownership can be asserted and protected. Um, though the principles, again, may seem most relevant to data, uh, something that a lot of archivists are not very accustomed to working with. Um, these principles, I think, are very similar to ideas that we see in the other standards. Um, particularly, Indigenous communities have primary rights to the information that is related to them. Um, and the last standard I'll touch on briefly is the Reconciliation Framework for Canadian Archives. Um, this is a, a standard that was released fairly recently. Um, and it was released in response to a call of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, so the TRC call 70 um, asked basically national archival associations to um, look at the landscape and determine if Canadian archives were um, in compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, and the UN Join It or Rent Liquor Principles, um, and also to produce a report which would kind of recommend how to implement those mechanisms. Um, so the body that actually created this report um, includes representatives from all the major archival institutions in Canada, um, and the task force, which actually authored the report, um, included representatives from First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities, um, as well as some non-Indigenous archivists. Uh, one of the major takeaways of the report is, um, and this is a direct quote, that Canada's archival communities must respect First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people's intellectual sovereignty over archival materials created by or about them. Um, so archivists um, have a professional duty to engage in building relationships with Indigenous communities um, that are founded on respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. Um, and one of the nice things about this framework is that the OCAP principles are uh, baked into it. Um, I'll really quickly touch on uh, some of what is happening at McMaster, and uh, if anyone has further questions or wants to know more about collections, um, send me an email. You can find my email address online. Um, maybe Bridget can pop it in the chat as well. Thanks to Bridget. Um, so one of the first things that I've been thinking about is that to participate in kind of meaningful relationship building with Indigenous communities um, in a more proactive way, 
Non-Indigenous archivists need to know what they have, um, who it belongs to, or who is represented in it, and how it was um, acquired. This idea about kind of um, knowing how records were acquired is supported by some of the guidelines. So um, the reconciliation framework, this is a direct quote, says that archivists need to evaluate the contexts of acquisition for um, indigenous related archival materials and begin the process of repatriation or returning those records uh, when appropriate. So our department specifically is the custodian of over 700 archival font and collections. Um, and many of these were acquired prior to um, the start date of the current staff team. So, you know, to put it in perspective, the department opened in the 1960s and um, I started working there in 2018. Um, so there's a lot that, you know, we need to know um, about our own collections, uh, you know, to support this work. Uh, one thing I can say is that the department for many years um, did not really prioritize the acquisition of archival materials related to or from Indigenous peoples, um, with the exception of records from Pauline Johnson, uh, who was a prominent Mohawk poet who lived in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, starting in 2000, the department started to receive some donations that uh, were a little more complicated. Um, some archives from uh, non-Indigenous anthropologists who had worked with or researched um, Indigenous communities. Um, and started in the 20, starting in the 2010s, we began to acquire some records um, from living Indigenous creators. Um, probably most significantly is the archive of Dr. Basil Johnston, um, which we uh, acquired in 2012. Um, Basil Johnston was a renowned Ojibwe writer, uh, language preserver, and ethnologist. Um, this archive is super significant, so I always, uh, you know, try to highlight it whenever I can. Um, it's an amazing language resource for uh, folks, um, Anishinaabe Moan language resource specifically. Um, and the archive was recently added to UNESCO's Canada Memory of the World Register. Um, the other archive that we acquired uh, from a living Indigenous creator um, was the archive of Daniel David Moses, uh, who was a Delaware playwright who grew up in Six Nations. Um, as of today, we have 16 fully processed archives uh, related to Indigenous peoples. Um, the steps that we're taking to better care for these collections, we're currently working on a survey for internal use. Um, this is my project, so the anticipated completion date is whenever I can do it in 2023. Um, and the, the survey aims to answer this basic question of what do we have, um, who might it be relevant to, and how did our department acquire it? And the hope is that this survey will contribute to um, some relationship building and outreach with Indigenous communities um, on and off campus, um, probably on an archive by archive basis, uh, policy development and um, updates to archival descriptions and, and terminology if needed. Um, I'll touch really quickly on digitization support. Um, so a lot of the principles outline, you know, when, um, when an archive is approached by an Indigenous community with a request for digitization of records, we uh, attempt to work with the community to provide copies in a timely fashion, um, free of charge, because we really do want to reduce barriers to access. Um, it's important to note that most of the collections in our holdings that are related to Indigenous communities have not been um, made available online. And there's a reason for that. Um, we want to consult with appropriate representatives from uh, communities before making works widely available uh, for download. We recognize that um, some of the conditions under which knowledge can be ethically and legally acquired can, you know, change through time. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that if we digitize anything, it's, it's presented with sufficient uh, context. Um, the specific example of, of the work that we did with uh, Woodland to support the 1924 exhibit, um, Heather visited our archives and uh, flagged items of interest for the exhibit, and we arranged for about a thousand pages to be uh, copied in PDF format. Uh, the turnaround time for the project was um, about a month. We were able to do this because um, we have a full-time staff member who digitizes items as part of our digitization program. Um, I'll shout out here Alex da Costa Furtado and uh, Krista Jamison, who worked on this project behind the scenes. Um, and I'll just close by saying that 
Staff in the department really do consider this work to be an important part of our job. Um, these are matters that are close to our hearts. And we recognize that we're at the beginning of a process of trying to kind of care for collections and engage in um, outreach with communities more ethically. For me personally, um, I know that this process will span probably my entire career. Um, and I, I'm committed to continuing to learning uh, with humility on the journey. So that's it for me. Um, we have about four minutes left. Um, Heather, what do you think? Can we squeeze in one, uh, one question? <laughs> Sure, I've been really quickly trying to answer questions as well in the chat. Um, there's a couple here about that I'd really like to answer actually where they're asking about um, this being a, an emotional topic. Um, so Nanda, shout out, uh, and also uh, someone anonymously asked it as well. So first, uh, I just want to say, um, it is a very emotional topic. And so the way that uh, we're trying to approach it or mostly, I guess, the way that I'm trying to approach it as the person writing a lot of the text uh, is to focus on the concerns that were shared across all of the different folks within the community. So um, irregardless of whether, oh yeah, sorry, I will read the full, there's full question. So I'll read Nanda's because it's shorter. Um, how are you ensuring that the upcoming display at Woodland Cultural Center and interpretation of the historical record of the 1924 deposing event does not inflame dangerous or angry political rhetoric in the current day community happenings on Six Nations? So for folks that uh, aren't from Six Nations or know this topic very well, this is still a really, really uh, hotly contested tested issue. Of course, both forms of governance exist right now in the community. Um, and so this has current ramifications. Um, and so, so for me, working on the text for the exhibit, one of the things that I've really tried to do, and this will happen at both the start of the exhibition and the end of the exhibition, is focus on the common concerns. So based on the uh, archival records, um, and also some of the oral history that we have, the things that people were worried about was actually the same. Um, they were, everybody was worried about loss of land, everybody was worried about changing environment, um, healthcare, education, um, nobody liked the Indian Affairs Office in Brantford. <laughs> um, so there were common concerns and debates about how to address those concerns. Um, and so what I would say is that we start with that at the start of the exhibit. We also end with that where the end part of the exhibit is entirely focused on the um, perspectives of uh, youth from Six Nations. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the concerns that existed in 1924 still exist today. Um, and then one of the other things that we're covering um, is looking at how uh, historians and anthropologists um, like William Fenton wrote about the community from a concept of fractionalism. He was actually hired by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the United States to document the different fractions, the different disagreeing groups in Six Nations. And he had a big influence on academic scholarship. And so ever since that time, that's what everybody has focused on, right? Rather than focusing on the things that are a concern for everybody and um, continue to be a concern. And so those are two of the ways. Um, Nanda also asked a really good question about um, emotional supports for the community. Um, and actually, that is something that I didn't have uh, in the exhibition, but it is something that I'm going to now flag, uh, certainly in terms of what we can do uh, for people through the exhibition. But yeah, it is a, it's a really, it is still a controversial topic, but it, it's one we kind of have to talk about and we have to talk about based on our, our own uh, oral histories and then also uh, archival records. Um, and and pictures and and every bit of historical material we can get access to really, because um, I think uh, we, you know it's it's easy to keep fighting, but I'm hoping that the exhibit will help people to focus on the things that still are unaddressed. Um, 
So I hope that's helpful. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, hopefully you have time for one more question. <laughs> yeah, we can, um, if uh, we're technically at uh, time right now, but I think ah. maybe we can, uh, we can do one more question and then I'll, uh, and then I'll close up. Um, yes, but if folks have to leave, um, I know some folks are writing in the chat, they've got to go, but uh, yeah, let's do one more question, Heather. Is sure. there one you'd like to answer specifically or? Um, so just quickly, I want to give a shout out to Buddy for his like big long timeline that he just threw in there for us because that's super yes. helpful. So I hope other people can see those things too. I'm not sure they can. I, I cut and pasted it myself, but maybe we can cut and paste it into the chat, I guess, uh, if that's cool. Um, there will be a big timeline in the exhibition, I should say that. So one whole wall is a timeline. Um, what I would say is timelines really help us to understand things across time, but I'm also hoping we can sort of understand things more expansively. So the Indian agent in Six Nations when all this is going on, um, Colonel Morgan, he had served in the Boer Wars. So probably not the best person to be in charge of a community. Actually, a lot of Indian agents have been in the military. Um, and sorry, I should say in charge with some air quotes there, uh, because of course, we had our own government. Um, he was just the representative of Ottawa and really took that to heart in not a good way. Um, so uh, it's important to sort of understand those other things that are influencing what's going on. And of course, there's also um, uh, sort of the Bolshevik revolution is happening at this time as well. And so there's a lot of fear just sort of globally by governments about sort of like revolutionary acts and uh, people essentially asserting their rights. Um, and so this is also sort of uh, what is framing, you know, you've got this timeline, but you've also got this sort of like framing of things that are happening globally um, that hopefully we can cover. Um, the biggest challenge of being a curator is that you have really limited amount of text, probably about 8,000 words for the whole exhibition, because of course, folks that are visiting don't want to read a wall of text. I don't want to read a wall of text. So we really had to try and be specific as much as possible and in a way that's interesting um, for visitors. Thank you, um, Heather. There, there was a question that I thought was really um, interesting. I don't know if you uh, want to take one more now. Um, I can read it uh, aloud. And I've, I've unfortunately have lost the name of the person who asked this, but um, the question was, do we know what role, if any, the clan mothers had when all these men outlined in this research um, decided how community lands and resources were to be utilized? Ah, uh, thanks. I did. So yeah, I guess people wouldn't see my answer to that. So um there, so I should say uh one challenge of working with uh archival records sometimes is that the voices of women are not very well recorded. But in this case, we have found uh, some really good examples and, and where women recorded their experiences. Um, so some folks might be familiar with, there's a letter that is in the collection at Library Archives Canada. It doesn't deal directly with land. Um, it deals with um, young men who had signed up to, for military service who were underage. Um, it demonstrates that women certainly were directly contacting the government. Um, I also have a couple of references, some from the Loyalists Association and members of the D. Horner group, and one in particular that's actually from, at the time, a condoled uh, chief. Um, who are making like really disparaging remarks about women and about clan mothers. And so to be from my perspective, and you know, this is sort of just based on the things that I'm reading and, and trying to understand. Uh, oh, and also, of course, women would not have had a vote in this. Although at the Thompson Commission, two women do testify and one of them uh, makes the argument, uh, Miss Emily, uh, Tobacco, Tobacco um, argues that women should have a vote. So I'll say that. Um, they're uh, specifically about the land. I haven't seen anything, but women asserting their role in community, uh, contacting government, and then men, both from uh, sort of both, I guess we'll say political sides, making disparaging remarks about women. Uh, and I do think um, the sort of patriarchal uh, 
nature of settler society was having some influence, not on everybody and not on everything. And it doesn't mean that women stopped to assert their important roles, clan mothers and women who were not clan mothers as well. Um, but I do think that it was it was definitely creeping in uh, to community. And then, of course, once the elected system was in place, um, the uh, elections, uh, women could not vote uh, for the band council or, or run to hold a position within band council. So um, certainly that was a challenge there as well. And I think this is something that we're still, uh, at least from my perspective, what I see is that um, the clan mothers are working really hard to uh, make sure that their voice is heard and that their clan families uh, concerns are brought forward at Confederacy. And, and I'm really happy to see that. And I think we can um, certainly support more in that happening because that's, you know, that's like literally the foundation <laughs> of the great law <laughs> is that role of women, right? So like, we really, really need to make sure that we're supporting that and uplifting that. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, address in these kind of final few minutes? I know, um, yeah, we've just got so many questions <laughs> and so many comments to respond to. So, um. uh, oh my gosh, there are so many good ones. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I should shout out uh, if anybody is working on projects around this time period or doing research around this time period, please, 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 please get in contact with me. Um, there's a lot of information. I, I'm one person. I do not think that I have all the answers and I do my best to sort of understand what was going on in the past, but I know there's stories in people's families. Uh, if you have photos of this time period that you're willing to share with us to put in the exhibit, um, yeah, please, please, you know, reach out to me at Woodland. Uh, I will, I will never claim to be an expert on anything. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the story together. So, uh, and make, make a space that we can, you know, talk about these things that are going on uh, in Six Nations, talk about the things that are happening more broadly across all our communities in this time period, um, and also help folks who aren't from Six Nations to understand, uh, you know, how important this was in 1924 and how important it is still is today. Um, so I guess that's sort of my final thing. And thank you everybody who came. That It's so generous of you to give up this time in your day to come, come hear this. Um, and I just want to uh, thank you, Heather, so much. Um, it was such a wonderful talk and, and so informative for, uh, you know, everyone, but, you know, for, for me and for us who work in the archives to um, just know more about some of these records that, you know, we've been entrusted with. Um, for everyone, just some kind of closing matters. Um, this talk was recorded um, and a link with full captions will be available for viewing in about a week. Um, the alumni office will send you a link and the video will also be available with captions on McMaster University's um, UTV YouTube channel. Um, you will see a survey pop up when the webinar ends. Um, we're all very appreciative of your feedback, so please do um, fill it out. And um, thank you once again to, uh, to Heather, to my colleague Bridget Whittle, um, to the team at alumni, and to all of you for joining us today. Um, thank you so much and have a great afternoon.